the American Emergency Department. If you stand here, in these hallways quietly, under the hum of urgency and the endless distant sirens, you can feel the ripple of a life altered. This is where faith and science meet. Outcomes are decided by moments, split-second decisions. Each patient needs a finely tuned mission with a dedicated, specially trained team led by the emergency physician. These are the doctors who care for you at any time of day. I think the moment I knew that emergency medicine was for me was September 29th, 2005. Uh, we were in Iraq. I was about a couple of years out of residency. And so I was in Balad, I was the chief of the ER, and we had the largest mass casualty uh, at that point in the war. We took care of one patient after the other, Marines and soldiers that were coming in, and it was hard. Um, and at the end of that, we um, sat down, the trauma czar, who's a lead surgeon and the commander who was an orthopedic, um, looked at me and said, thank God you were there. And for a moment I said, well, I didn't do anything different. This is what I trained to do in emergency medicine. This is what I do. And it just impacted me that, you know, I was doing this right. <laughs> Yeah, ASEP has had a tremendous impact on my career in particular. Um, so for my career development, from a, a leadership standpoint and developing collaborations nationally, leading different committees, um, for sure. As you, you know, train in emergency medicine, I think you see a lot of things and then you start to develop things that affect you more than others. And so part of it is keeping it light um, so that you can do this for 20 or 30 years. And also part of it is just making it real, making the patients real and family real, almost as if they're your family. I tell you, it is funny how a cup of coffee or a glass of water makes patients feel much better and then having someone do it right away. Five minutes is a long damn time to get, get a cup of coffee. So. I'll tell you a second. Hey, here you go. Yeah. Hey there, Dr. Babarda is not there now. What they do think it might be is appendicitis. Yeah. Pressure is a privilege, right? So having that um, is exciting and, and I think plus it keeps you uh, engaged in patient care and your career. So to me, pressure is a privilege. I think it's, it's lucky to have it. There is an issue of burnout and ASEP is addressing this, but I think physicians are, emergency physicians are less to get overwhelmed than other physicians do in this. Because um, they're, they're trained and as we, you know, their personality fits the specialty, and so I think this is what they want to do. So the CAT scan looks great. No sign of uh, any change in her aneurysm is what it's called, so remember that. I bet you emergency medicine 50 years ago was uh, less safe, less efficient for sure. People from other services rotated down to the emergency department uh, to work, so dermatology, pulmonology, urology came down and saw patients for all kinds of things. Um, which is not the best care form at the time. I think the forefathers, as early folks, men and women that were emergency medicine leaders, um, saw that and saw patients were getting harmed and not being treated safely and decided this is the right thing to do. During the conflicts in Korea and Vietnam, physicians on the home front began to recognize that procedures and techniques developed for the battlefield were relevant for hospitals too triage and timely innovative treatment of injury and illness would save lives everywhere. Despite the rapid growth in emergency visits throughout the 1950s and 1960s, many U.S. hospitals still didn't have emergency departments as late as the mid-1960s. In 1968, a group of eight physicians, pioneers, set out to improve the quality of emergency care and to develop a new medical specialty. They formed the American College of Emergency Physicians. In 1979, just 11 years after ASAP's formation, emergency medicine was recognized as the nation's 23rd medical specialty. Well, 
yes, I was the first emergency medicine resident, and it was serendipity. I was in the right place at the right time. I was went to the University of Cincinnati. I did like every other medical student. I wandered around the different parts of the hospital and went to the emergency department and said, "Wow, this is this has got to be cool." Uh, so maybe I can do this as a practice and asked around and got the usual responses. No, there's no such training and why would any idiot want to do that anyhow? Uh, uh, and at that point, uh, what I usually say is that I didn't feel that way and if I were a stock, I'd buy me. I can tell you this, if you have some carbon monoxide poisoning, it's mild and you're going to be fine. But I do need to know that. And you don't smoke, right? If he did okay. smoke, what would you expect his CO level of you as a pack-a-day smoker? Uh, carboxyhemoglobin for smokers, about 10. Yeah, for right, people 10. like us, it's about 5. You're, so. you're ahead of me. Good. Okay. You got Thank it. You, sir. you don't know everything about all diseases, but you know real important things. And it's very clear to me now, we know them way better than a lot of other folks. I mean, the, the average layperson would say, well, if I come in with a heart attack or with chest pain, I want a cardiologist to see me. And my response to that would be, I see... 20 times more chest pain than any cardiologist does. You know what I document on those people? The ability to adduct the elbow into the chest. Okay. Oh my God, we're getting an accident waiting to happen. Okay. Yeah. 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 Do yeah. you want to put it on the cardiac probe and look at the heart on the next pulse check for me, Tony? That'd be a good idea. Yep. Patient was uh, coming in with supposedly a heart attack, uh, and so they were just bringing him down to be seen, and he arrested in the elevator on the way down for, no, we don't know. So we're throwing the kitchen sink at him and see what happens. We got his heart back for now, live for now, so. Yeah, we can go ahead and start cooling protocol on him. Yeah. I uh, have told this to everybody that wants to listen. Is and yeah, I even did it when I was ASAP president. Is we're in a zero era environment. You can't make any errors in our environment. Residents and doctors have trained for years to do this. What do you see from right here? This right here. Don't have to go any farther. Yeah, you might hear that. What do you see? But look at the position of the right and left foot. See, one is straight up, the other one's on the side. One is a 49-year-old that's unresponsive. Okay. Um, supposedly doesn't have any pulses on the right side. Uh oh. How far up? They're on the scene now. They just called to give a heads up. The other one is responsive with right hip pain. So, but he's so, supposedly unresponsive. So, so what organ comes to mind with no pulses on one side after a fall? Aorta. Yeah, aorta. Sorry. I get uh, cases from doctors who would never answer what the resident did in one second. They'd be there all day trying to figure that out. The question I got the first 10 years I practiced was, what are you going to do when you're finished with this? And I haven't gotten that question for years. So they're starting to catch on a little bit. It's all, uh, it's all a challenge every, every shift, but you know, we're, all, we're all used to it. I've said before that, though, if I get to a point where I can't cry, then I don't want to work anymore. So I, I do, not every time, but I do once in a while. Every once in a while when somebody dies, you go into the room and hold their hand and talk to them. They're dead, but you talk to them anyhow. That makes me feel better, yeah. Just for a second. But I only thought I wanted to be an emergency medicine physician. There was no other thought in my mind. Emergency medicine is a vehicle for social justice. It means that I can see anyone who comes in through my doors, and my job is to serve them for their emergency medical needs, regardless of their ability to pay, what language they speak, uh, their race, their perceived ethnicity, any of that. It doesn't matter what their political affiliation is. It's the sickest person first. So if you're wearing pearls, but you're not as sick as the guy with maggots in his leg, maggots in his leg, that guy's going to go first. I mean, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do a painful procedure to someone just because someone else wants it. It's not medically indicated. But if they want, if their goal is to make him comfortable, that's not going to make him comfortable. <laughs> you want to rest your fingers there on my leg, but don't, don't move them. Honestly, there's more of them than there are of me. I have one brain and two hands. So, I mean, as you've seen throughout the day, I'm on my way to do one thing, and someone stops me, and I either have to figure out, do I fix that problem now? or try to remember it, or write it down, or ask the scribe to remember it. Because it's, it's tough when you're juggling, this person needs to be intubated, but so does that one. 
who needs it first <laughs> when it's just you? Oh, you can put her back down a little. She has to be 30 uh, degrees angulated. But in order for me to get the NG tube in, I needed her up. It's the other one. Go to the other green knob. Twist it. You're brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> you solved it. He's ready. Here's the plan. We did another round as open X. ASAP is in a lot of ways the, the game changer for emergency medicine. I think it's really great for us to be able to advocate as emergency physicians, but also ultimately for our patients. Anything that's good for me is basically good for my patient, right? Like if I actually had a lunch break, it would arguably be better for my patients because I'm a human and 12 hours, to imagine 12 hours without eating and drinking is, if a patient told me that, I'd worry about their safety, um, to be very honest. I get frustrated. Sometimes I'm, I'm visibly <laughs> frustrated. No, not to nurses. Like someone has put my name on a chart and then also Luba's and we never knew these patients were like, we looked at the board and we're like, oh, we're seeing this person, I've never heard of them. I'm Dr. Chisholm Straker. I'm sorry for the delay. Thanks for your patience. There's different frustrations. There's the disappointment of, I should have done something differently. And there's the disappointment of, this system should have worked better. So this is 23s from intervals, no ST elevations. How often does your phone ring? More than it should. My phone rings way more than it should. Hello, the Kabarda. Hello, the Kabarda. Hello, the Kabarda. Hello, the Kabarda. We really do look more to evidence-based algorithms and policies and guidelines to try to understand what's the best thing to do for someone as opposed to what have we always done. Um, I think that's really important because what seems logical, the research doesn't always show us that that is what bears out for a good outcome. We're having these debates about what's the right thing to do because the goal is really to do the best thing for our community members and what we think is right just isn't always. So I like that that's changing. Um, it's not gonna get easier, it's just gonna get more and more complicated and complex, which is difficult, but good. There's three things I think are important for any emergency physician, any professional, is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I think as we go forward in emergency care and these healthcare systems, big healthcare systems, I think mastery and purpose won't go away. I think they'll be there. I think my concern and many others for physicians in particular and emergency physicians is losing autonomy. I think when you lose autonomy, then you don't feel as compelled in the same way as you would otherwise. You lose some excellent candidates coming into medicine. I think that could be a threat to physicians and medical care going forward. Well, first of all, the, the database of medical knowledge is quadruple or maybe going up a hundred times. So knowing it all is impossible. So what you really need to know is what you don't know. Outcomes are much better. Um, uh, I, I know that the, as much as I've criticized the way the trauma system works, it's the, the system itself has saved you know, zillions of lives from trauma, from accidents. Um, I think we've saved many, 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 many lives. The development of emergency medicine as a specialty is already a remarkable 50-year story in the making. Looking ahead, the story of the next 50 years will certainly build on that growth and yet will be affected by the challenges facing the entire nation. ASEP membership today stands at 38,000 strong, and emergency medicine is now ranked among the most prestigious and respected medical specialties in the United States. This year, in 2018, ASEP is celebrating its 50th anniversary. 50 years of advancing emergency care with a history inextricably linked with the advancement and recognition of the specialty. Stand here, quietly, and under the hum and urgency and the endless distant sirens, you can feel the ripple of lives altered. You feel the worry, the hopefulness, and the mending, the need to help. This is America's true safety net. And these are the emergency physicians. Congratulations, American College of Emergency Physicians, for 50 years of advancing emergency care and making every second count.